old days, BT was live, you could raise it in milk. Oh yeah, you know? right, or coconut We really coconut should have juice. like, you know, some little, little Brewer. reservoirs, yeah, of those kinds of things, you know, the things that, because of course they're all natural, they all can be, but right now we're dependent on these faraway labs and stuff, but they should be regionally, you know, just like you have seed banks, you should have biocontrol sure. banks, which we don't have right now. Right, and we need. And, you know, it'll be a lot harder to isolate, you know, Bacillus subtilis, you know, once it's all gone to crap. But you can brew it, you know. You just There's tens of thousands of strains of BT that attack any insect that you can possibly imagine. So there's even a strain that attacks Japanese beetle now. I did my PhD on Bacillus thuringiensis, so I know a little bit about it. A little bit here and a little there. A little bit, yeah, a little bit here and there at Virginia Tech. If you create diversity, if you just grow the things that make you happy. You know, if you realize that you need to have flowers in your garden, that you want to let your plants go to seed, that your herbs all eventually are going to flower, and that's just great. It's good to cut them back a bunch of times and get good harvest and keep them getting too bushy. But you can't stop them, and when they go to seed, they're going to be covered up with beneficials. You create that diversity, I'd say at least 90%, maybe 95% of your bug problems. It's just not there. You don't even have to think about it. It's all taken care of by them. But those last few... They're the tough ones, and that's more what we're going to focus on today, like the things you can buy. We're going to cover the farmscaping principles, so you've got that, because that's your basic toolkit you start with. When I came out of Virginia Tech with a PhD and became biocontrol administrator for the state of North Carolina and also the state apiarist, Patrick, along with uh, some folks in China that I was working with, began to tell me, and I also knew this just because I was a beekeeper, how important it is to have a well-fed, mated, beneficial. I can tell you from studies that we did with the wasp that I was working with, this wasp called Cotia glomerata that attacks imported cabbage worm, and we'll show some pictures of it later. If that wasp was not properly fed, it would lay 30 eggs. If that wasp was properly fed, it would lay 300 eggs. You have a tenfold increase in beneficial activity if you can get these things to realize their biotic potential. So the other thing that would happen in a lot of places is you could have somebody who was organic, but they don't have the farmscape set up, right? So they're doing, Patrick might be doing this and having great success because he's provided the food. You have somebody else and I go to their place and it's like a parking lot. And I'm like, you have got to put in floral resources. You've got to have a site for overwintering. You have to think of the whole circle for all of these beneficials and also the plants. And sometimes this feels overwhelming because you're sitting there thinking, good grief, there's you know, 10 beneficial plants that I'm working with and they flower at different times and then I've got this other insect. But it's actually, to me, if you take portion controlled servings of it, it's very fun and it's exciting. You learn a lot, your ego gets shattered 100 times so that you become more of a steward rather than a policeman on your place. Way back when there was that movie called uh, Field of Dreams the thing they said in that movie was build it and they will come, right? Before we get going, we have several people I want to honor. I want to honor Chuck Marsh, one of the founders of Earth Haven, a stalwart organic and permaculturist. Also, I want to honor Tony Cleese, who passed, and also Patricia Allison. So people are going to the other side and it's part of my demographic now. But I just want to say this guy, along with Patrick and along with a lot of other pioneers, really pushed the envelope and made this work. Let's look at this for a minute. The most common phrase that I have ever heard as an entomologist to a group of people in the public about an insect is, I didn't know what it was, so I killed it. <laughs> they all look alike. <laughs> they all look alike, even if they're in their own backyard or they've got their pants down. There was a, a day here where I spotted hatching out anchor bugs. You know how gorgeous those guys are oh, when they're yeah, hatching they're out? Beautiful. They're like jewels. Right. They're like, 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 they could be earrings, you know? And I turned the leaf so I could find it, take a picture. I got back five minutes later, somebody had squished them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's bugs. Right. <laughs> One of the things that we want to do, whether we're talking about what we call operational biology, which we can get into later, but what is our definition of farmscaping for us? It's the deliberate use of beneficial insects and plants to increase biodiversity and to attract and conserve what we're gonna call beneficials. So when I think of my garden or farm, those are just mini livestock. 
a grasshoppers, mini livestock, a parasitic wasp, ladybug, all this stuff. And so one of the things that becomes very important, and this is where Patrick and the soil health people really brought us to the next level, which is you've got to have, and we'll get to this after this class, you've got to have your soil balanced, or you've got to have healthy soil. If you think back to when he and I were doing this almost 30 years ago, these guys were going out and buying these old tobacco farms that were actually just worn out, you know what I mean, in the Triangle area. Harvey Harmon, Ken Dawson, they had to spend the first three to five years bringing organic matter to just to bring that soil back to life. And they hauled Dawson, yeah. truckloads of yeah. leaves, yeah. just leaves. And then he got his worms going. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen, you can get on YouTube, there's these time lapse where they have layers of organic matter and sawdust and you watch these worms just take that stuff and go, you know what I mean? And, and it's uh, six months of activity in about three minutes, but it's beautiful. And that's what we see going on. So all of your trophic levels need to be good. The classic one for us as organic and permaculture growers is an obsession with nitrogen. If one shovel of manure is good, then two shovels has to be twice as good, right? With a little dusting of fish, right? Yeah, with some kelp, you know, I mean, jacket to the nines, you know. This guy, he had the biggest raspberries I'd ever seen, and they wouldn't bloom. So I showed him a picture of my raspberries, which were on clay, and they were this tall, and they had 30 berries apiece, that tall. I said, you are obsessed with nitrogen. You keep dumping, your berries are never gonna bloom because you've got them in such a juvenile state, they will never bloom. One of the things that we try to tell people initially is back off your nitrogen. If you've got aphids or other soft-bodied insect pests and you're a farm, show me your soil test. And I bet you got more nitrogen, you know. I mean, 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre is enough and if it's biologically available, it doesn't look like it's there. The exception is once the predators are, fro are frozen out and the aphids get to boom yes. in the late fall. Because right. aphids can reproduce, you know, basically aphids have been photographed giving live birth to aphids giving live birth. And they, they do it with parthenogenesis. They don't take the time for sex. Which means they multiply so fast that if after, after you've had a couple of hard freezes, but then it warms up, the predators are all in. You know, they're just not going to wake up. They're just like in and then the aphids explode. So you'll see those kind of problems then. That doesn't mean you have too much nitrogen. That's, that just means that the aphids have a, a moment where they're not under constant attack. And when they have that, they right. can explode because they can reproduce so quick. Right. Yeah. And so the other thing that we think about when we think about you know, farming in Rome is that pests are messengers. And what we do is we try to kill the messenger, <laughs> right? So this, you know, let's take Colorado potato beetle, right? You know what I mean? Is, I have people call me up and they go, I have Colorado potato beetle problems year after year. I'm like, you need to be listening. There's something going on there. You can grow your potatoes in mulch that the beetles can't get through or there's, there's certain things that you can do. So we have a lot of that. And the other thing that I always try to tell everybody is try to think holistically and modularly where You've got this who, what, when, where, why, and how, because a lot of times we'll start some crazy project back in my day, and it's so huge, there's no way I could have done that thing. You know what I mean? Some, maybe a giant composting thing. You really want to have a strategy when you work with all this, okay? So here's our five main points. I'm going to say them, then we're going to talk about them, and I'm going to say them again. This is kind of our boiled down operating system. And we would just bounce off each other. So what's going what's to be the last thing blooming? What's going to be the earliest thing blooming here? Just like figure out, you know, how do you get the longest time of bloom? You know, what's going to have the most pollen? You know, and it's not like you're, you're only growing those things. You also just want to grow things because they're fun. I still, my favorite moment with Brinkley, um, Richard got Virginia Tech to do farmscaping like nobody had ever done before. And I stopped off on a, a trip that I was making and was looking at this whole map, I mean, farmscape and just insane, right? Like oh, yeah. 300 foot long, six foot wide farmscaping rows, you know, it's just like. All broken down by plant. Yeah, no wonder it worked, you know? And so we're out there looking at it all and I go, wait a minute, isn't that stevia? And he goes, yeah. And I said, so why do you have that in there? He says, my son likes it. And I'm like, you're gonna be successful because you don't just do formulas. You do things just to do them. 
And lo and behold, what's one of the last things to bloom? Stevia. You know, so it's actually a very important farmscaping plant. How do we find that out? Because we like to grow it for other reasons. So it's ne there's never a static formula. You know, when people want formulas, we give you formulas all day long. Now, if you think about production ag in the old days with the extension agents, it was prescription chemistry, right? There was, a, there was an IPM threshold. If you hit a half worm per broccoli plant, you spray this, right? Our system is totally more refined than that. So for example, with broccoli, what we found out at Virginia Tech was once those little seedlings got established, you had to get them established first, get about you know, six to eight leaves, they could take 50% defoliation up to the time that the head buttoned, and then you could still clean that plant up, okay? So you would have this broccoli plant that would have 24 leaves, they get about two dozen leaves before they reach maturity, we would do leaf counts on all this stuff, it would make that little button in there, the whole thing's open. If we had pests at that point, we could spray our broccoli, clean it up, we sprayed it once. And that was really for market. Because I'm gonna tell you, growing for market, if you're growing for Earth Fair or something, it's a total different beast. I have done it. I've did it for years with broccoli. Can't have one worm in there. No, you cannot. They'll reject the whole truckload. While those worms are defoliating, the table's been set and everybody just comes in and they're just tearing everything up. You would like this, when we started, we had this one field and we were really doing great farmscaping. It was loaded with ladybugs. And on Sundays, all the farmers had found out that we were growing organic broccoli down in Valley Cruces. So they'd come on Sunday, we would be sure to be there too, because it was like a zoo, right? You'd had to wait till right after church. So about 1.30, they'd had lunch. Here come the trucks. They'd come by, the first one would come up and they'd go, what are you growing? And we learned to say this this way. We would say organic broccoli. You had to say, you didn't say broccoli because they, they thought that was weird enough. But all these guys were transitioning out of tobacco. We got the Golden Leaf Grant in Watauga County to transition tobacco growers to growing organic broccoli. Okay, so that's a little bit off, but we'll get back to that. All right, so here's your five main points. And most of this is common sense. You want your plant species diversity and you want the correct ones for your area and your microclimate and your little holler. You want to increase this plant structural diversity where you stack and pack and you've got architecturally diverse zones. So you, ha because you have different zones for food, mating usually occurs around flowers or nectar sources. You need to have an overwintering site, which we use yarrow. Yarrow is a good one for your parasitic wasp. If you're gonna have pupation sites like uh, the coatsia wasp that I work with makes little cocoons on the broccoli. So what we would do is we would cut our broccoli stalks to till the field, but we would pile the stalks up in the corner to let the cocoons come out of them. And rather than tilling them under and losing all of our beneficials. If you start right now, this time of year, focusing on having a healthy beneficial population, you've gotten one or two generations in before anybody else even wakes up and starts to think about this, and you don't have the pest problems that other people have. So I'm sitting in grower groups down in the coastal plain with Kenny Haynes and these other guys, and they're talking about pickle worm. And pickle worm's a big pest of cucumbers. All the growers in there except Kenny are conventional. And after a while, all of them start turning to Kenny, and they're going, Kenny? And he's a real quiet guy. He's real quiet. Real quiet. He, it, when he talks, it's like thunder. Listen. Yeah. Listen to what, the, when he opens his mouth, get ready, buddy, because what's coming out is going to be like a lightning bolt. So they're sitting there, and they're going, so they look, and they go, Kenny, do you have any problem with pickle worm? He goes, no. And then somebody else goes, well, you're probably not growing very many cucumbers. How many, how many acres of cucumbers you got? 30. <laughs> so all of a sudden, these guys are going. They're holding their head. They're going over to Kenny's farm. We had farmscaped it. We were using hairy vetch and rye. The amount of predators going through that system was just phenomenal. So here are these big guys out in the coastal plain that can do the same thing that we can do out here on, the, on, our, on our smaller plots, because everybody's like, well, that's just the size of your plot. Well, no, this is goldenrod. This is the edge of one of our broccoli fields. But the important thing about this is this becomes our harborage for all of our natural enemies. These are banker plants or your insectary. 
So what we try to do is on the edges of our fields where it's appropriate, here is a close up of just one of those thousands of goldenrods that you see. Now some of them don't have aphids on them, but the ones that do are covered in these red aphids and all your natural enemies that are gonna go for your vegetable pests later on are breeding right here and making their first generation. It's gonna jump out into our field. So if you look here, you've got C7 ladybug, you've got a Harmonia ladybug, you've got surfids, you've got, here's a surfid maggot right here. See this little green maggot? And it's, it's fun to watch because these things will crawl up, they'll just grab a, 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 an aphid, hold it up. So, well, the other thing that you're seeing here, all these little black spots, those are predated aphids. Those are, aphid, those are not normal, those aren't aphid cast skins. That's devastation occurring. The other thing that begins to happen once these things start to feed is a lot of these aphids send out an alarm pheromone and they actually just drop off the plant. If they drop to the ground, and if they drop to the ground in my fields, it would be the same thing as you trying to walk through the Rift Valley of Africa at night, one mile. I will guarantee something is gonna take you out. You cannot be walking along at night in the Rift Valley. If a warthog sees you, it's gonna kill you. If a hyena sees you, the pack's gonna take you down. It's the same thing here. We just made a smaller version of this. When these things fall off, if they're on the ground, we have carabids. Those beneficials that are there, they're just getting big and strong and tough. And when the aphids are all gone, they're still hungry. And if there are no flowering plants and your bugs haven't really gotten bad yet, they might just go look for some more food. But if there's flowering pants, plants, they just move to those plants and feed on pollen, feed on nectar. This is a recent trip that I took to Jamaica to the source farm where I was doing farmscaping with those guys. And let me tell you what happened. As soon as I got down there, I began to shut up and let them teach me. Here's what happened. They don't know the beneficials, but they know all of these plants. So this is a plant called Kalalu. We should be growing this plant. It's an amaranth. Oh, we are. And, oh, you are? Oh, yeah, well, then I need some of your plants. Because this is delicious. It's kind of like a stem broccoli, and they have it, you know, with vinegar and butter and stuff. I mean, every, you know, they that. They eat the flowering parts, too. They eat the flowering parts. There's about, this is another variety. There's about five varieties of Kalalu. So Clive Thomas here, who is just a fabulous grower, his field's out this way. He's growing um, those Caribbean pumpkins that are the white and green speck. The bush knowledge of these guys is incredible. So I could hand this to him and he would say, now this is, if you do it this way, it's medicinal. If you use it this way, it's for food. You know, I'm just holding my head. So it was really neat to meet up with these guys because I knew a lot about the bugs that were visiting these plants, which they didn't know, but they were telling me all about these plants. So it's see, really cool. Really, if you're gonna know one thing, the plants are way more important than the bugs. The bugs will figure themselves out, Yeah. you know? The bugs are gonna happen no matter what. Set and if you got the diversity, you don't need to know who they are. Dick does, I know some, he knows more than me, but I can do farmscaping just as well as him because the bugs do, it, do their own thing once you give them the diversity. Right. What we're doing here, if we condense this down, we're doing integrated parasite pathogen and predator management. So they used to call it IPM, but we call it IPPPM. This handout, which will be on the Living Web Farm website, so this was written in 1969. He has five principles. The thing that I learned a long time ago because I was a corn insect scout for years and I was a, you know, I was a, I was a row crop scout for years, they wanted us to go out and look for the pests. And after a while, what I began to realize is, you guys have the focus totally wrong. You're waiting to react after something happens. What we can do is do the front end where we are trying to do 90% of this is prevention. So when Kenny Haynes goes to a meeting and he says, well, I got 30 acres of cucumbers, but I don't have a problem with pickle worm. That's the same thing that begins to happen here. We begin, to, you just begin to see a lot of the recalcitrant problems. If you address them correctly, they just start to disappear. Do you guys have problems with Japanese beetles? The Midwest is being killed by Japanese beetle because for the last 20 years, the nursery industry has been shipping nursery stock out there without doing the biocontrol program that would go along with it. And we'll talk about that later this afternoon. So we're shifting the focus from the pest 
to having a healthy population of beneficials, and these are beneficials that attack every stage of the pest. We'll show you that in a second. One of the ones that we used to use, and I just use this as a standard example, is Beneficial Blend 50. It was this big 50-pound bag of beneficial insect plants came in a seed mix. Brinkley hated it, and it was hard to mix up because you had big bursine clover seeds and you had little baby breast seeds. You know, everything would be a little bit random. But the key ideas, and this is something that I will put on the website too, the key ideas that go along with this Beneficial Blend where they talk about how it's used, the sparse, weedy appearance of two seeds per square foot, works great, but you cannot, if you take this beneficial blend and pour it out, the mustards come up, they choke everything else out, and you don't have anything left, because you didn't plant it right. If I am out scouting, and I have my scout form, and we can create scouting forms for any crop that you guys have, right now, I would want to see a third to a quarter of the plants that I sample have some type of beneficial insect activity. I may not see a beneficial. I might see a ladybug pupa case that's empty, but that's a beneficial that was there, and I know it's there, so I'm out looking for, if a little parasitic wasp flies by, I can say that's a briconid. I don't know which one it is, but you know what I mean is I'm starting to see the, the, the insects that show me that I have a healthy system. Aphid mummies, partially eaten Colorado potato beetle egg masses. If you want to get real geeky, you can use, you can go to statistical programs, do a sample size power analysis where it says you need to sample this many plants to get this kind of confidence interval. We don't need to talk statistics, but for people that do, and you, you know, if you're in production ag, this is where these guys go, because they have to have the money, you know, they have to justify their system. Here is my PhD field. The first year I was at Virginia Tech, I did a spring and a fall crop. The variety is called Pac-Man, so it's an early variety. It doesn't taste very good, and the bugs know it too. I had to begin to rear imported cabbage worm in the lab and put them on these plants. And I'm sitting there going, something's wrong. This, this shouldn't be going on. So we had done a study where we had eight varieties of broccoli, and the one that had the most pests was one called Green Comet. It was a longer day variety. So I'm like, excuse me, but if we're going to do anything, I mean, I've proven that, pack, that insects just don't like it, and we don't like it very much either. We'll eat it, but it's not great. So premium crop and Green Comet, premium crop was really the one. So we started planting premium crop, and I should have another picture because I moved from this place to another farm. I left the Hort farm. There's no farmscaping here at all. The only thing that there possibly is is this stand of pines over here. But yeah, but this is like, this is, Wal this is a Walmart parking lot. I actually have a picture of me in Walmart parking lot with a, I should get that picture out and show it to you, but it's the same thing. Now, Contrast this picture, within an hour of me being at Highland Lake Inn, my mouth is open, I'm looking at Patrick, bugs are flying in my mouth because there's just so, I mean, it's just amazing. No, I'm just teasing about that part. But we go into this greenhouse here in the, in the early spring, this time of year, he's got about 10 types of beneficials in there. In fact, he had some beneficials that I hadn't seen in a really long time. The other neat thing about this system that he can tell you about, but that I'm just gonna go on ahead and say, this is kind of like a green firework because he set stuff up so that the insects would march from one part of the field and then when that part browned out, they would come back. And sometimes it'd be because we would let something get infested with aphids. We were done with it and the aphids would cover up something and we just, just go ahead, tear it up. You know, we're done. And then all the beneficials come through and then mow down that crop and all the ladybugs move over, all the other insects Oh, that one's done now. I gotta go look for some more food. So I've got a bigger picture of this later on, but I wanna show you this because there's certain really neat things that were going on in this. One of the things that they were having a problem with were stink bugs. We knew right away, so somebody says stink bug, what you wanna think of are green pods because stink bugs love green pods so you can trap them. So the way we would trap them was we planted Cleon at the ends of a lot of these rows. And what, we, what Patrick did and we ended up doing is putting a wash tub with soap down there. Wow. 
And when we would walk by, he'd just shake that cleum, and all these harlequin bugs would just fall right into the soap. And he'd come by a couple hours later, there'd be the, some more that'd come in, shake, boom, down into that. The other thing is, is I squeeze harlequin bugs like, that's my bubble wrap. <laughs> if I get to heaven and St. Peter is a big harlequin bug, I'm just gonna, I'm gone. <laughs> okay. But Charles Church, what he'd do is every broccoli that didn't take, he'd, he'd throw some mustard seed down. Yeah. And then they'd cut, they loved the mustard way more than the broccoli. When they were all over the mustard, he'd come through with his flamer and yeah. take them all out. And we actually got a SARE grant to do this with Charles, where we actually did leaf mustard patches in our broccoli plot. The, here's a trick. Oh, let's just take broccoli and farmscaping for a minute. If you've got a field like this with broccoli, what you want to do is you want to farmscape the perimeter all the way around it, and then you run, run some stuff down the middle. So what happens when I would come to a field like this that was farmscaped that had all these other crucifers, had mustards, radishes, all of the pests that are coming in won't go to this because it's not high in mustard oils. They'll go to the mustards and the radishes. So the very first things that happen is you have a filter strip around your field. So you've got this farmscaping and it acts kind of like a force field in that it attracts the pests in. So we could control harlequin bug and a lot of our cabbage pests because they would lodge in the farmscaping first. We could spray it. If I was out scouting, I always had a little squirt thing that had soap in it because if I found a broccoli plant that had a harlequin bug, they're social and they lay eggs. We got, I've got pictures of little harlequin bug eggs over on the table. We'll look at that this afternoon. But I always knew when I saw a harlequin bug, you gotta flip the leaves over and look for the eggs. So if I saw the eggs, I'd just shoot it with soap, which would, which would or I, I could knock them off, but I'd, I'd always shoot them with soap because I wanna knock that wax layer off and it will kill them. The other thing that we would do is take some of those eggs, put them in a baby food jar and see whether the bug came out or the parasitic wasp that attacked the eggs. And once we started getting the parasitic wasps, then we would start to leave the eggs alone because then they would wipe the harlequin bugs out. And those wasps, of course, they're not going to eat the harlequin bugs. They're going to feed on flowers. They're going to lay their eggs in, those, in, the, in, in the eggs of the harlequin bug. And all of those perimeter plants, the mustards and the radishes, what do they do? They go to seed. Right. And they have tons of flowers. So you get that you bring the bad guys to them and then you feed the good guys. Right. Now the good guys are eating right where the bad guys are. Right. It works pretty well. The thing that you want to remember about this too is you, if to get from this point, which most people are starting at, to this point, you've got a rebuilding clock and you've got to be patient. So that's one of the things I try to tell people is you're not going to reach heaven in one step. If you think you're going to have all this done in one year or two years, no, it takes a while to build this up. Here is BB50 put on way too thick, not read by instructions. Look how thick the mustards are. This is great though. It'll trap flea beetles, harlequin bugs, imported cabbage worm, diamondback moth, cabbage looper. We have a new pest that Brad Hinckley sent me a picture of. We have yellow margin leaf beetle that attacks crucifers now. It came into Florida, I don't know, but it's up in, it's in Kannapolis. So there's a new, you know, here's another new pest. So one of the things that we think about with this BB50 is this is a redundant system. This is uh, Jake and Bo. When I would go to Jake's farm and look at this stuff, the dogs knew it and the dogs would come and eat. They're eating the, the leaves of this because they, they somehow knew that I was interested in this. So I used to say dogs love its chewy taste. So, but these are this, this is a multiple redundant system where there's an acre of garlic here that we uh, irrigated HB nematodes in and had no onion maggot. So this is all, you know. No flea beetles either. Actually. No flea, no, no, no flea beetles. And we, they had a third of an acre of Johnny's salad mix. And that's, you know, you could see the before and after of that. So the goal for this becomes whichever pest it is, I want you to lay out every life stage of that pest. And then under that, you want to have the natural enemy that attacks it. And then under that, what we're going to do is have the support system for that natural enemy. This is low-level continuous stress. Let's just take imported cabbage worm, because I did my PhD on this with BT and looked at the interaction with natural enemies. 
So you got your egg stage here. There's a bunch of other stuff that attacks it, but I just want to give you some of the generalists that attack it. Ladybugs, you guys know, of course. Surfids are those little hoverflies that we saw the maggots of. Lace wings. Uh, trichogramma, there's other, you know, bugs, there's anchor bugs would feed on, oh, I didn't have that down. Then you've got each one of, you've got five larval stages just for this caterpillar. In the early stages, you get a lot of overlap between some of this stuff. So that's why I put same as, as larva number two. These briconid wasps sting the little larva and lay eggs in them. Then by the time you get up to these third instars, they're getting away from these wasps because they're getting big enough that they can bite and wiggle and, and, and it wouldn't be as successful. So you start to get into your uh, ground beetles, your predatory stink bugs, assassin bugs, same thing here, paper wasps for your fifth larva. Then when you get to the pupa, this is a specific wasp called Terramalis puparum. It wrapped around there. You also have your predatory bugs. You have your ground beetles, crabids. And then, here's the crazy one, I should have worn this shirt today because I forgot, but Patrick calls me up and he says, hey, I'm seeing imported cabbage worm butterflies and they're going sideways in my field because they're being eaten by dragonflies. Dragonflies are just dragon wasps. <laughs> I'm down at Charles Church's field when he's telling me this. I said, well, let me go look down in our field. We're right by the Watauga River and we've been doing farmscaping and things were coming along and sure enough, same thing, damselflies and dragonflies just swooping down and grabbing these butterflies. That was a point that I was gonna make to you too about the Sunday, these guys driving around on Sunday. They go down to our field. They're sitting there, I get a phone call. You better come and spray your field. Who is this? This is farmer so-and-so. <laughs> you better spray this. Why should I spray it? Well, there's a hundred butterflies down here flying around. I said, yeah, but are, are, do you see any leaf damage? And he goes, no, that's the funny thing. I don't, there's no, you know, we've got these big leaves like this, you know, no holes in them at all. Because that was just a death trap for imported cabbage. We had so many ladybugs in that field, they were eating the eggs and the larvae before they would ever get to be a big caterpillar and cause leaf area damage. I had the owner of the Beneficial Insect Company, Jim Klutz, warned me about that. Do you know how many butterflies? You better do something about it. I said, Jim, I think it's okay. And then Jackie Greenfield, I gotta take those purple cabbages in for the for the you know for garnish for the plates. They can't have worms on them. You better do something. It's like, I'm gonna just watch, you know? And all taken care of. No worms, you know. Even though everybody's seeing all those butterflies, just because there's butterflies doesn't mean that those larvae ever get to live. The next one down would be Japanese beetle. And it has three larval instars. They're below ground, along with the egg stage, and then the pupa, and then the adult. So we, we don't really have too much that attacks the eggs. We have crabids and nematodes. You've got milky spore and nematodes that attack the first, lar the first instar larvae. Then by the time you get to this one, you get some wasps that we'll talk about this afternoon that actually attack the grub, and there's food plants for them. It's called the spring tiffia, okay? The third instar of the same thing, you have spring and fall tiffia. There's a tiffia that attacks now, and there's another species that comes out in the summer and attacks the summer and fall grub. We don't have anything that attacks the pupa, and that's bad. And so that's one of the reasons that Japanese beetle can still kind of be a pest, is we don't have it bracketed, not like imported cabbage worm. You know, imported cabbage worm to me is a wuss. We can take that thing out. I have successfully introduced this fly from Maine and Connecticut to the area around Boone because it was similar. And I, I, I got the fly established by 2000. I'll show you some pictures later on of Japanese beetles. They have big white macrotype eggs on them and they're dead in five days. It's the female that lay the egg every time. Right? Yeah, they lay 95% of their eggs on females. This is a scouting graph. Notice I only have three instars on here because we never got any large <laughs> So if you look here, this blue line are the eggs that are laid, okay? The next line down is the first, is the first instar, right? Second instar and third instar. So you see as you go through time, here's July, or here's June, okay, so we start in May, right, okay, that runs this way. The thing I want you to notice is, notice Look at the numbers of eggs that are laid, and then look at the first instars, second, 
and then thirds, and then no fourths and no fifths. So what's happening is if we get a 50% kill between stages, that's almost good enough. I'm just giving you this number-wise so that, I mean, this would be on my scouting form that I would take and put in an Excel spreadsheet, line these out, do, you know, I can do whatever table I want, I can do statistics on them all I want. But the important thing that I want to show you is just the drop between the egg stage and then look out here later on, of course, as you're getting fewer and fewer eggs. And then I never even hit an economic threshold and this is no, okay, so CT is conventional till and NT is no till, all right? So you can see sometimes a conventional till, but the, they were so, they were side by side, so it confounded the whole thing. Think about your plant structural diversity. So here is the edge of our field of broccoli. This is our BB50 mix. And this is this time of year. It might be just it might be just a little bit later, maybe a couple weeks later. But you you know our mustards would be up. Here's a surfed fly in there. Here's a harmonia lady beetle. And this is just in one shot of one little tiny area in our farmscaping. Because what happens over time, if you let these systems build up, they, the beneficials come out earlier and they do more and more control. So once again, this is the critical time of year to get your beneficials going right now, and then they ride herd on everything else. You've got red maple blooming out there, I can see right outside. So there's pollen being made right now that's, that's, that's coming in. And what we have, of course, is a greenhouse full of brassicas that are going to seed. So we've got an explosion of life right. going to happen. One of our theories has always been the two-week theory, is that the beneficials are always going to arrive two weeks late. <laughs> They're there but you're, you know, your pest problem's big, you need to have it dealt with now, and then two weeks from now, boom, there they are. So that's why we're talking about timing and how important it is to have these early generations of these natural enemies now, because then it's like a wave, they ride that wave. If they don't get caught on that wave initially, all summer long, all you're doing is playing catch up, because you cannot catch up to the biological reproduction. The other thing that we always try to do and you guys saw it from that table, is work backwards from the pest to the beneficials that attack it to the plants and the structures that support those things, okay? Here we are again. This is Patrick's world, and I'm learning from Patrick's world. So I want to just show you again. If you look at this, this would be the lakeside coming down this way, right? And so they have Jerusalem artichoke here, Look at the floral resources of it. Obviously, it's late summer because they bloom pretty late in the summer. He's let his asparagus go. Didn't have a lot of asparagus beetle problems because he has predators coming in there to feed on them. And that one, what we always let happen, and I recommend anybody that has asparagus needs to have parsnips. Parsnips will just volunteer, and they'll get huge, and they'll make great big flowers. And basically, there's a a little bit of time from when you stop cutting your asparagus, which means that none of the eggs, right, the eggs are laid on the spears, so you're basically controlling the, the beetle until you stop cutting. And then there's maybe two weeks or so when maybe you should go out there and soap or knock those eggs off, and then the parsnips in bloom. Right. And you have Pennsylvania soldier beetle, you have C-Mac ladybug, and those guys are just cruising, they're just egg eaters. They're just out there eating all those eggs, and right. you're in control. You know, you see a few, you always want to see a few pests, and I misspoke earlier, I spoke about good and bad. There isn't any good, there isn't any bad. You know, if you don't have those so-called bad, you don't have food for the things that control it, then you get this burgeoning population and it takes a while, as Richard said, you may never catch up. So you wanna have a few, it's like, you, know, you, you might think, oh, well I've got every asparagus beetle gone except for these 20, I'm gonna go get some Pyganic and wipe them out too. Right. Then you're in trouble, you know? When you go for absolutes on one end or the other, you're going to run into trouble, right? You know, if you, if you cannot stand, I'm, I was at an entomology party in Blacksburg one night and the neighbor was spraying and I'm like, what are you spraying for? I don't like lightning bugs. <laughs> There's a whole group of entomologists right next door looking at this guy going, what the heck are you doing? One of the tricks, once again, that we mentioned earlier, but I think this is bears saying again, is a lot of this, Patrick started in this greenhouse, so this got him a month ahead of everybody else, and then he just opens the door, and all that Pandora's box of beneficials just goes out into the field. 
And so he was able to do things that most normal people wouldn't either think of doing, but, but it worked. I mean, that's the great thing. So you take these lessons about jump-starting your beneficials or putting enough of them out, you know, in big numbers. And a huge one is really understanding the concept of economic threshold. When do you need to act and not to act until you have to act? Because if you act before that, you don't give the beneficials a chance to get going. Now, there's times that can be a mistake. The time I lost a crop of cauliflower because I kept waiting on the cross-striped cabbage worm to get controlled. And I called Dick up and he goes, no, 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 you can't do that with oh, them, yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> Those guys are gregarious and they're going to eat you up. You know, sure. they just, there's too many of them, you have to spray the BT. And by the time I did, it was too late. We lost about half of our cauliflower crop. The threshold for action is when the cost of damage equals the cost of treatment. Okay. So if you got BT and it's real cheap and you can spray BT for 15 bucks an acre, your economic threshold can be real low, right? But if, you're, if you have to use something like spinosad on boxwoods for, you know, boxwood leaf miner, you may let that thing go for a long time until you see the little things flying around it before you would spray it, right? So the other thing I want you to think about is how much you're worth an hour and figure that in because that helps you begin to decide if it's worth, so I had a guy call me up. He's getting torn, and this is just two days ago. He's getting torn up with cabbage maggot. He asked me, should I try to rescue the crop? I said, you know what? I can get on the internet and I can order you a thousand organic cabbage seedlings for way cheaper than you're gonna be able to treat that mess. You need to get rid of that stuff and start over again. So a lot of times, back when we were doing New River Organic Growers, we would always grow twice as many seedlings as we needed because if we had part of a crop failure or people didn't like our seedlings, we would trade them out. And at the end of the season or, or the end of when we needed them, we would have all these other plants. And let me tell you, you can get rid of seedlings. Boy, there's a whole boom, 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 boom. boom. You can get rid of them. So the other thing that uh, one of the other thing, stories that Patrick had was there was a sparrow nest somewhere. Uh, okay. It was the house sparrow, right? A pest, right? Not even, not even a, a songbird, you know, this terrible pest, you know? And that was the crop of purple cauliflower that Jackie was so worried about, that it was going to be full of worms, right? And she said, you got to do something. I'm going to be taking it in in two weeks. And so what I'm going to do is watch and wait. And there were getting to be some worms in there. You know, and I was starting to think maybe I need to spray. And then I walked down one morning and this barn was pretty derelict at that time. It's been reconditioned since then, full of house sparrows, just full of them. It was like a convoy. They'd fly into that vase, grab that worm and fly back to their nest. And they were feeding their babies all day long, wiped out those guys, you know, totally wiped them out. Of course, the FDA would be really worried about that. All those birds, you know. <laughs> getting in those, cat, in those broccoli, boy, we don't want that, you know. But it works, it worked totally, totally perfectly, you know, the solved the problem. The really nice about this is the restaurant was up this way and people would finish dinner and come out and walk through the garden because this garden is just so visually beautiful. There's and so much we tell them this story and the, the thing that was lots of fun, I think I've heard me say this before, is there would be these couples and it, was, it could be either sex, but there would be one member of the couple that wanted flowers and one member that only wanted vegetables and didn't have time for flowers. And we'd be walking through here, I'd be giving the wrap, and all of a sudden, the one that didn't want flowers would go, oh, so flowers are really important, and the other one would come over and hug them. <laughs> and it was like... Realization! <laughs> right. And it happened, and I, and I love that it, was, it could be either way. It wasn't just that it was only the women that wanted flowers. It didn't, there was always somebody that didn't want flowers and somebody who did, and they would just realize right there that they could agree that flowers were part of it.